So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the possi and thank you for the possibility to come back here in uh, Switzerland, where I stay for 10 years. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for having invited me to play the role of the bad guy. I try to do as best as I can. OK, so I, I run a bit because there, there, I have a lot of things to say, and I have only 40 minutes. So I start with a, uh, with a statement. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, I have no commercial interest. I am not consulted in company, and um, it's important. I have no personal conflicts with team or other people that have published in this topic. Uh, so it's nothing personal, actually. This this talk. It's uh, I take this talk more as uh, something about science, okay? Uh, where I will use the example of the acute chronic workload ratio um, to show how sometimes we make. Uh, we make errors in our in, when we build the theory or when we develop studies. So that is important that you understand that's nothing personal. It's just a talk about science. So the concept. Let's start from the concept. Um, actually, the, the first time I heard about the acute chronic ratio was something quite familiar because I started my uh, activity in in uh, sports science training cyclists. So we were. You are using a software which was training peaks before 2008, and as team has a, a knowledge in a, in a paper, uh, we were we also used the um, these um, let's say uh, some suggestions of Andrew Cogan, and these suggestions were based on uh, using the chronic training load, which was which is the exponentially weighted moving average calculated over 42 days. Uh, and the acute training load, which is calculated over seven days. This corresponds to, uh, to the model of uh, bunnies around fitness and fatigue. And they use the training stress balance. And we are talking about 2008. But uh, they used this uh, even earlier. So the, the reference model of this uh, uh, approach uh, is uh, the famous uh, uh, fitness fatigue model of Bannister. This is the formula, which actually it's relatively easy because taking consideration two forced orders equations, and the time constant for fatigue is from 5 to 15 days, and for fitness from 30 to 50 days. So this is the basic uh, uh, the background of this kind of approach. And in terms of uh, relating the injury risk to the training load, uh, in the 90s, uh, we, um, we know that uh, there were some attempts to develop a, a framework uh, linking uh, the overload injury to, the, uh, to let's say, to uh, a wrong, uh, a, a wrong uh, uh, planning of the train load. So they suggested that when you are overtrained, you induce, you can increase uh, the risk of, uh, of injury. So basically, these are the, the concepts um, behind all the discussion we have also today about the chronic load, um, acute load, uh, whatever. So it's nothing new actually. And so the idea uh, that the imbalance between fatigue and fitness is related to an increased injury risk is an old one. We are talking about 90s, so about 20 years. But I have to say that it's uh, uh, thanks to Tim that in the last years the uh, the studies uh, on this topic uh, uh, grow exponentially. So now we have a lot of studies on this topic, try to relate the training load to the injury. And this is something I, I acknowledge to Tim. But let's start a bit from the beginning. So we, uh, the first time that they published something about the acute chronic ratio and the relation uh, with injury load was in 2014 in the paper of Hewlin. I think the pronoun is Julian. Okay, so this is the first paper. Uh, you already show something. Before was done on cricket uh, bowlers, and they used 28 bowlers over five seasons. What they they have shown is that there is there was a relation. This is uh, the risk of injury, the likelihood of injury in the subsec subsequent week, and you see these two, the shape of this. Uh, curves, and here there is a higher injury risk when you use 
you, you use the internal load and the external load. The internal load was the session RP, the in, uh, external load uh, was the number of a ball bolt. If you, we look at the uh, um, current week, there's nothing, I mean, there, there's another kind of pattern. So this is the first study. There was a second study published two years later. This is the second study on uh, rugby league players. And here, if you have a look to the results here, in the subsequent week, uh, which is the same time frame where they found something here, there's nothing there. So uh, basically in the first two studies, sorry, here there's nothing, there's something in the current week, which is uh, at the opposite of the other study. And if you put everything together, you can have a sort of uh, the same shape uh, as you have seen with the average of the two weeks. So the first study is uh, the results in these first two studies were quite inconsistent. And you can see here graphically. So this is the external load because in the second study they use uh, an indicator of external load. So in 2016, you see here there's nothing, while there was something in 2014. And this is for the current week. This is in 2016 and this is in 2014. So you see two opposite directions. These are the data the, in the table. So I just presented in a graphical way. So basically in the current week, the results were at the opposite, the same for the subse subsequent. And so here we have the average of two weeks, which is the one uh, following more or less the shape that uh, you know. So the first question is why we switch to the two weeks average while in the other paper we were talking about one week uh, current and subsequent week. After this, uh, two papers, there were two, you see here the 3 October was accepted. The first one, within a couple of months, there were three opinion pieces, an editorial, a clinical analysis, and the review, which, which is uh, an endorsement from British Journal of Sport Medicine of this uh, uh, of this model, let's say, and if you read in this journal, you will see more than 11 opinion pieces about this topic. So for me, it's uh, it's an endorsement. I don't, I, I wouldn't be able to define it in another way. And in these two opinion pieces, we can find the first times where this uh, um, this graph that we have seen also in the presentation of team were presented the first time. So let's see how this graph was created. This is uh, copied by the paper. So basically what they have done, they have uh, modified this axis, moving, for example, here, the midpoint of the acute chronic workload ratio range, uh, 0, 5, 1. Um, so they move uh, the midpoint, uh, they move uh, the, the, the data in the midpoint. When it was uh, in the end point, they just move at the end or at the beginning. So, I mean, here it's quite clear. Uh, they combine internal and external load. So basically they move these points along this axis. And they combine st st uh, the data from cricket, rugby league, and Australian football. These two are the two st studies that I have shown to you earlier, and Australian football were not published at that time. And they combine with this data, with this uh, with this uh, um, range. Um, to be honest, I don't know, maybe after he can explain how th the point were adjusted based on this, uh, okay? But this is what this graph have done. So they move the data along this axis. What's the problem with this approach? Uh, when you study this range, this range are categories are not continuous data. And this is one of the problems, actually, of using this kind of ranges when you run this kind of uh, studies and when you run the statistics. Because the assumption is that uh, the, um, the risk of injury within each category is considered equal along all these categories, which is a problem. And this is one of the pitfalls of this criticization. Okay? So basically what I'm saying is that you cannot move, you cannot treat this axis as a continuous variable because it's not, it's a category. So basically, you cannot move the points along this axis because 
since you can do this in an arbitrary way, you can change the shape of the curve. So what I'm saying is that you cannot, you cannot really develop an equation and, uh, or fitting a curve using this data. So I'm questioning a bit uh, this, this graph. This graph, in theory, is technically not valid. And for example, you see here, how can we say that above 1.5, the injury risk is low? We cannot say that. So basically, this, uh, this graph is the combination of internal and external load in various ports. And one was not published. Uh, the reposition around the x-axis is quite arbitrary. Uh, we don't know exactly if the injuries were the one of the subsequent week or the current or the two average week. And we don't know uh, what was the reference category. Based on this equation, which is technically not correct, not appropriate, the, you have seen uh, in the presentation, uh, it was developed this, uh, this table, okay, which based on this equation and these examples. But I mean, that's not a huge concern. But I have to, to say that it was written that this graph was just an example, okay, it was not uh, just a guide on how to use the acute chronic ratio. And I mean, I would like it would be like that, but after one month, this the same graph was published again, this time with some colors and the sweet spot that he has shown before. So, but the problem is, uh, to be honest, maybe I am the one we promise. I don't see this sweet spot, to be honest. First of all, the, as, as uh, I have explained, this graph is questionable. A second is, uh, if I have a look to the papers, for example, here, I don't see a sweet spot, a point in which is lower than the other, at least statistically. I don't see the same here in another study. Uh, I, I'm just showing some of the studies of Tim. I don't see the sweet spot here. I mean, if you see, just tell me because maybe it's me. The first time I saw something was here in this paper but also, again, in this study, again, I don't see this sweet spot. So the question is, to be honest, I haven't seen this sweet spot because unless now we, it's enough to use visual inspection instead of statistics, there's no sweet spot. I mean, after we can discuss, I'm happy to discuss about that, but honestly, I don't see this sweet spot. It, there is a, a lower, the curve reach a lower level here, but as I said, if you move these points, for example, here, and you can do, because in the same way they move in that direction, I can move in the other direction, I would change the shape of the curve, and that's why this curve is wrong. But this was just a guide, so probably was published a second time, but unfortunately, it was published a third time, and this time it's even worse in a consensus statement. So. Uh, to be honest, I have to assume that all these guys here accepted this as, as something established because I'm participating to a consensus meeting uh, in the weekend and we had to provide uh, to all the, all, all the panel, all the systematic reviews, all the evidence behind, and I don't see the evidence behind this graph. If you want to see a consensus well done, have a look to this one so you understand why I'm questioning that consensus. And this was posted yesterday. He, he's a professor here in Basel, in Switzerland. And I understand that the editorials are important. We build theories, we discuss, but we cannot add in a consensus a table, a graph that has been proposed in, in a, an opinion piece. Uh, this was published again. So just a guide, but published again. Again, in another, in another consensus, I'm an associate editor of this journal, so I'm talking also about not other journal, other people, but also about ourselves, who was published again here and was published in a recent editorial. So it seems to me it has been published a lot just to, ask, to be uh, just a guide, probably too much, considering there was a problem. In the same paper, he showed this, he showed this uh, example, which is very good because you see here high 
uh, acute chronic and an injury immediately after. Of course, this kind of uh, example are selected example. I show you my example. This is uh, an example taken from one of the papers published by research group. They kindly send me. And if I show you this graph, you don't see anything. So nothing similar to what you have seen. So just presenting example, example, it doesn't help a lot. Okay, is a, a sort of confirmation bias. Another point that I would like to discuss is that we understand that there is a lot of debate around uh, this topic. And sometimes the debate, uh, it seems to me, a bit unbalanced. Uh, we know that uh, it's normal. In, in several topics, we have debates. And the letters rise most of the time conceptual issues. It's normal. You answer someone question, you answer. And I have done a lot of times. And that's a normal scientific debate. So in, uh, after publishing those papers, um, Paolo Menaspa sent this letter, basically um, questioning the use of the rolling average. Okay, the rolling average is just a simple average. And they, uh, he questioned this uh, because give the same weight of the load of four weeks ago to the most recent. And usually it's not like that. If you remember the, the model of Bannister, indeed they use a, a first order equation. So, but basically it just uh, writes some question about the rolling average. And this is the, the answer. I think the author, I was told is here. Okay, so this is your answer. And you, you wrote, uh, the acute chronic uh, workload ratio is strongly supported by the available literature. Reduction, reduction is then realistic uh, examples. Sophistry of the comparison. Okay. So let's have a look to your, to your reference list. You have three opinion pieces. Not very evidence, but you're right. There is a systematic review. So actually, if we look at the pyramid, the systematic review is here. So it seems there are actually the evidence, okay? So I would say that may be right. But Claire wrote a nice editorial saying that all that glitters is not gold because it depends on what is written in the, in the, in the systematic review and the level and the quality of the papers of the systematic review. So uh, I had a look to, to these systematic reviews. And what I have found is that the only two studies mentioning about the acute chronic ratio are again the first two, the one that they show you are show it in, in consistent results. Okay. So and you use the NOS scale, which is the scale for case studies and co uh, and court studies. So at best, the level of evidence is here. We have two studies that show not uh, consistent results. The sample is questionable, well, not, not the sample, but the number of uh, observation of injuries for each category, probably. So let's say these are case studies because it's one team, at best underpowered. So that's the level of, the, of evidence. So it seems to me that sometimes there is a confusion about what's evidence, because we have a consensus with graphs published on editorials and evidence in a, a cited, cited as a systematic review that use observational studies. So if you refer to a systematic review, of course, you give an impression of a high level of scientific evidence. But as have you seen, it's not that strong. So it seems to me a bit of bias, this. So uh, it's not really personal, but you presented your idea of overuse, injury, and training load error, which is your idea. It's questionable, probably, but it's an opinion. He presented an opinion. So it's an opinion versus opinion. By the way, you answer about the acute chronic ratio, but the, the question was about the rolling average. So it's the wrong answer to a different question. And what I think is that, what I think is that if someone is, al is allowed to present example, cherry picking one subject or another, I don't see why the others cannot do the same. So I don't, I, I don't think there's someone that can kill and the others that have they have not the same power. And the same uh, reductionist and realistic example was presented by Williams, suggested that the exponential weighted average can be better. But 
they are right. Uh, you can propose whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you have to compare. You have to see what's the best method, and you can see this only running studies, and they did it. And I have to say that they have shown that, you, you see here, this is the exponential weighted average, which is uh, what Minaspa and, uh, and Williams suggested, and actually they found that it's better than the rolling average. So they acknowledge that, uh, and they have shown also here. But do you, do you see something particular here in this graph? The rolling average here didn't work. So the method they, that was used in several studies in this case didn't work. So again, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying that the results are not consistent, okay? And here there's nothing. So they found something using the exponential weighted average suggested by these, uh, by these uh, colleagues, actually. So I would say that you have to offer a beer to this guy because they saved your paper. Because you see here, there is something and nothing with the rolling average. So what's the problem with, the, with these, all these studies? It's not the problem of Tim Gebet or other people, it's the problem of our, uh, all our colleagues. When they arrived in, uh, in Sydney, they were running a lot of studies on acute chronic ratio, and I, to be honest, I suspended most of this study, because in my opinion, the risk is that we can, uh, it's too easy to fish in, this, in those data, because first of all, we can use different ratios. There's no, uh, framework for defining the ratio. So you can see the first time you see the acute and the chronic, uh, uh, the second time you see the low acute combined with the high acute chronic. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. It's plenty of, uh, of ratios. Here you have more than, it's about 48, 49 ratios that you can use. You can use and you can define different categories. Here you see the categories. Here you see other categories, okay? Sometimes you use the data score, sometimes you define in an arbitrary way what are the categories, so we don't know exactly how to interpret this category. Also, the reference category is important. I show you this study, this study is by um, Franchini, published recently. So here they use the first, the first range as a reference, and they have a very likely harmful this is the MBI. I mean, I don't know if some of you, there is a lot of debate, but anyway, they use this approach and there is a very likely harmful um, effect. If you change the category and you use the second one, this very likely become likely. If you use this category as a reference, this is a statistical issue. When you run the statistic, you choose one reference category. Became unclear here. So from very uh, substantial to unclear, just changing the category. So how do we know what's the best category? What's the theoretical framework for deciding the category? Because otherwise, the risk of fishing the data is really high. And sometimes it's they even don't report what's the reference category. And this is a nice, a nice study that I suggest you, if you are interested in this kind of uh, studies, I suggest to read. And they explain uh, what are the dangers of discretization. And this is very, a very, uh, a very nice graph. Uh, it can be an example, but let's say it's a graph. They simulate the three scenarios. One, this is a, a simulate, this graph uh, is relative to this scenario. So no relation between the acute chronic load and the, and the injury risk. And this is the risk of false, false discovery rates. The, from D1, D3 are three different categorizations. So they categorize in different ways and they check how many times you have these false discovery rates or something, you, you see something that, that doesn't exist and they add from 20% to about 15%. But what's worst is this one. This, one, this bar says that if you have the freedom to choose one of these three categories without a framework, you can find 41% of false discovery rates. So again, this is the perfect spot for phishing. You decide what to do, you analyze the data, and you create your hypothesis later on. 
The other problem is that we have different external load indicators. So here, for example, in this study, there is the total distance, uh, high intensity distance, uh, uh, the, the, the player load accelerations. Here we have, uh, again, uh, player load the distance, different, maybe different uh, cutoff categories and so on. And here we have the number of balls and this guy is use the deceleration and they found something in this new in this new indicator so it's difficult to to understand how to interpret this this information and there is also the problem of different time frames okay for example in this study of greg and uh, dupont they check the four weeks two weeks three weeks uh, uh, they found nothing they try again and here they use, uh, they change the, the reference, they change again, and finally they found something, okay? So, the, in, in this study is another interesting study showing that uh, based on the, uh, the window of the acute and the window of the chronic, uh, the relative risk can change from as low as 1.69 to 2.74, just changing, just changing the windows. And there is the other problem about the injury definition, the injury lag, for example. You can use a no injury, two days, five days, current subsequent average of two weeks. Okay, so it's a, it's a bit complicated, yeah? Injury definition, we have different definitions. Sometimes are all the injuries. Sometimes are the injuries during the games because that these are the most important and we don't count the others. So again, this is quite confusing. So. It's very difficult. The uh, results are uh, inconsistent and difficult to interpret. I, I, I read all the papers and I honestly find some problems in interpreting. This is a study where uh, there is also Will Hawkins, the developer of the MBI. You see how many cutoff values have been used here? How many risk, uh, these are uh, uh, hazard ratio have been calculated here? We have 133 hazard ratios plus these ones. So we, are, we have almost 150 hazard ratios. If someone of you is familiar with the, the problem of, of alpha inflation, I think is, is a bit worried about that. But do, do you see something strange in this paper? This is, a, I think, is a very well done study. Eh? Do you see something interesting in, in these results? The black is when there is something, let's say, substantial because it's not significant. It's another kind of approach. So here we have something substantial, always. Seven days rolling average, 14 days, 21 days, smoothed seven day. So all the indicators show something. And here again, 14, 28, the rolling average show something, the smoothed show something. Even the monotony and the strain calculated, these are two indicators. So all the indicators show that high load is related uh, to an increased injury risk. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite complicated. So, in a recent paper, uh, team published in a recent ed 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 education, education review, he tried to debunk some myth and he did a good thing. So, the first is load explain all injuries. So, what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that you created the myth, but I'm afraid that you contributed a bit to, to support this myth. Because this is something that, if you write something like that in your editorials, it's, I'm not surprised that people start to think that load can explain all the injuries. Yeah? I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not saying. Or if you write that this is the accuracy of the model prediction. I don't know if you are familiar with statistics, but here we are talking about 87% of sensitivity and almost a perfect specificity, which is uh, quite impressive. But this gives the impression that with the training load, you can predict the injuries. So it's very high, actually. And again, these are in other editorials or opinion pieces, whatever you you like, uh, so the acunic work ratio is the important metric, it's not the destination, is the workload. So all these uh, statements here increase the, 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 um, the risk that people interpret too strictly what you have done. And for example, you have published another paper about the association and prediction, and you wrote here that you're using the title 
you're using the title of the word pre predict. By the way, I mean, this was a sort of answer to, this, uh, to the study of Funkin, another one of Alan McCall. I'm used to send a letter to the editors, editor, but now it's more common to write editorials. And just in the title, I don't think so. You wrote several times within the text, but again, it's not a big issue within the text. But you also wrote this in these two, in these two uh, opinion pieces. Athlete workload can predict injury, modeling the training load injury relation and using it to predict injury. Again, here in your article, you, you wrote that uh, basically you provide an example, you try to say that it's wrong to, to, to interpret as a predictor, but if you write that losing 29% of the squad over a short period of time, transforming the risk of injury in an in a actual rate as you have done here, it's uh, almost like interpreting it like a prediction. And the 10% rule, I mean, if you write to minimize the risk of injury, practitioner should limit weekly training load uh, to less than 10%. It seems to me that you are enforcing the 10% rule. I acknowledge that you explain better, but before arriving to explain something, you have to be careful. Also, the graph that you show, you show several times clearly show that above 10%, the injury risk is high. If I see all this information, I'm a practitioner, I start to think that the 10% rule works and probably it works in some situation. And again here, you underline that above 10%, the injury risk increase. So I'm saying again that we have to be very careful when we write something because people can interpret in another way. Again, the magic number 1.5, I agree that you wrote several times. The problem is that if you write in all the papers that 1.5 represent the danger zone and things like that, and you did several times here, 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 and here, you did here, and sometimes it's 1.44, and you round it at 1.5, and here again. So if you write so many times, people start to think that 1.5 is a magic number, uh, and we have to be careful about that. Uh, when I talk about bias, I also talk about how we extract the information from, from the papers. And this, uh, you also presented this table, I just showed the first two studies. Here you have a plus indicating that the acute uh, chronic ratio, rapid increase in workload increased the injury risk and the low decreased the injury risk. I had a look to the, to the paper and non-contact injury because we, this is what we refer in all the papers. I don't see this increase. There's something in the contact, but I think you, you don't want it to refer to the contact. And the same for the low workload, uh, the chroni low chronic ratio. Again, here, non-contact, I don't see anything. So if we look at the second study cited here, low chronic workload ratio increased the uh, risk of injury. Low chronic ratio, uh, I had a look to the papers, and this is the distance during the games. So they model the, da the data of the games, not of the training. So this is even not relevant to that table. So to I try to conclude. Now don't stand up because I conclude in five minutes. Yeah. So the, um, that's something good. I'm not saying it's bad because uh, I, that's, it's, it's normal. I'm trying, I was called to be the bad guy, so I'm doing the bad guy. But uh, there's something, I have to say that in the last two, three years, we are studying a lot of this issue and there are a lot of groups and probably in the, ne in the future, we will increase the level of the research in this area because uh, uh, team raised this this, uh, this uh, issue, important issue. So what we know is actually is nothing new. If you train too much, you increase the risk of injuries. And we know that uh, the progression is important and that's another, good, uh, and another important information. We also know that other indicators of training load, like the strain and monotony, the, the one I showed you earlier, probably are good indicators. It's not only the acute chronic ratio, but now we have more evidence. It's not strong because these are observational studies, as you know. So we need experimental studies. It's difficult to do whatever you want, but this is what we need. And that's science. That's good. So uh, even if it's, it's something that we have always heard about from coaches, we need some numbers. And uh, team provided these numbers. So that's fine. The problem is that from a practical point of view, what do we do? 
It's, uh, he explained about all the mediators, moderators. Uh, we know he, he showed you that, he said that 1.5, you, you cannot use really cutoff values. So, and the results are inconsistent. We know that high chronic load can protect sometimes, sometimes cannot protect because there are studies showing the opposite. The same for the acute, acute chronic ratio, sometimes protect, sometimes not, sometimes mm, uh, even increase. So there are no consistent results. So we, we just can take this as a general guideline, which is fine, but we cannot go more than that. We have some practical problems. I, I don't enter in the detail, but the, between theory and practice, sometimes there are there's, there's some conflict. I invite you to read this uh, letter from Martin Bouchai, but some issues are the same that he explained uh, earlier. But what are the, what's the bad, what are the problems? First of all, we have spurious correlations, the risk of spurious correlation. There is a huge debate, I don't want to enter, I leave uh, Atkinson uh, to, uh, to address this issue. The approach are not optimal. This is a, a, a paper where uh, published where there is both uh, uh, Claire and Tim are, are here and you see most of the studies have, have been done with the logistic regression. Where is the logistic uh, here? Okay, this is a, a systematic review. So when you see red, uh, this means that the author didn't address some pitfalls in an appropriate way. So it's more red than green. So you understand that the statistical, uh, statistical methods used are quite, are not optimal. There is the problem of what kind of statistic to use. For example, they now use the MBI using 1.1, 0.9 as a uh, as smallest worldwide change. But for example, we'll suggest the 1.2 in some papers. So I don't know why you choose 1.1 and, and or not the 1.2. Again, changing the reference can change the results. Inconsistency, inconsistency of reporting and not clear. It's difficult to combine the results. Range are different. Someone, uh, they report the uh, risk ratio. Someone uh, reported the hazard ratio. So it's, it's really difficult to understand. Partial training load. Usually when you use GPS, you have only this data and you don't have this data. In most of the studies, these data were not modeled. So wha wha we consider this not important. Why we consider this not, not important? Uh, we have a lot of case studies actually, studies with 14 players, alpha inflation, risk to find something which is significant or substantial but actually is not. And there is no theoretical framework actually. So what we can do, uh, now uh, other problems. Uh, this area has a lot of bias, as you have seen, confirmation, interpretation, cherry picking, strong man arguments. There is some selective reporting, the risk of data phishing uh, abuse, too many opinions. I'm not referring to Tim, I'm referring to all the, I, I, I focus on, on the studies of uh, Agave because it's here. I don't want to say something up, uh, about the other studies, but overall in this area, the, these are the problems that you can find unjustified endorsement and sometimes conflict of interest. So what do we do for the future for, for trying to progress? First of all, we need a better theoretical framework. We don't have to fish. We need the, would be better to pre-register the, the study so that we say in advance what we want to see, why only some parameters, why that reference category. And we have to report the results better so that we can understand the methods and we need to know a bit more research designs. Read, the, if you are interested, read these two very well done papers. They show you how to, you can run some appropriate statistical analysis. I have finished, this the last slide. So. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, the issue is that we have to be very careful as a researcher. Nowadays, uh, everything we do in few minutes after the publication are around the world, social media, uh, all these kind of, uh, of, uh, of instruments. And we have to be careful on the message. We have to be much more careful than in the past what we write in the abstract, for example, because 90% of the people will read our abstract. They don't read the paper. So if in the apps that you don't write the limitation and you write something strong, this strong message is the one spreading around the world. So we need to prevent this misinformation, okay? And not the bank, because when we debunk, it's too late. Sometimes we are not able to stop something that we have created, okay? And that's, and that's the, the, the key point of my, of my talk. 
I make a prediction. <laughs> I know, uh, let's see if I'm right. I think we will read other opinion pieces about this topic. And next year, we see if my prediction is wrong or is, or is good. Thank you very much for your attention.